I want to welcome all of you this morning. It is uh, just wonderful to be with you. Ki mitzion tetzei Torah. Out of Zion shall go forth Torah. I literally came out of Zion uh, the other day. I arrived Thursday morning. Define Zion. And, uh, <laughs> define Zion. Zion in <laughs> Tanakh is uh, traditionally a synonym for Jerusalem, for Jerusalem. So I am here direct from Jerusalem. I could not be happier to be a part of this weekend celebrating your rabbi, Rabbi Hal Rudin Loria. Uh, it is, uh, I feel elated, I feel exalted being here with all of you. Um, and especially this morning to be able to learn Torah together, to learn Torah intensely, deeply, thoughtfully. So I thank you for coming out early. Uh, don't tell me that you came out for the locks and not for me. I don't want to hear that. Um, I, uh, wonderful that there's such a, a, a beautiful spread here. And I thank um, all of you that were involved in, in putting this together. Um, a little uh, about me uh, before we jump in. Uh, I was uh, born in Brooklyn, New York, like every authentic Jew. <laughs> and uh, I was raised in Friel, New Jersey, just down the road from where it is that Rabbi Hal grew up. Uh, Freehold is famous for being Bruce Springsteen's hometown. Uh, growing up, I was very involved in our local synagogue. Uh, I, I grew up in Young Judea. That sort of uh, gave me um, the Zionist seeds that burst forth later on in life. Uh, and uh, I did my undergraduate work at Colgate University in International Relations Middle East Studies. Uh, was very, very involved in building up Jewish life while a student at Colgate. After Colgate, I went on to the Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies, a very wonderful, intense year of, of learning there, and then continued. Uh, I made the decision to go to rabbinical school at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and I've been with the Jewish Theological Seminary ever since. I've been with the Jewish Theological Seminary for um, close to 30 years at this point. Uh, the first five years as a student at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, and then uh, 24 years working in a professional capacity. When I return to Israel, I'm going to be transitioning into a new position, uh, and that is Vice President of Machon Schechter, Vice President of the Schechter Institutes. And in Israel, uh, Schechter is essentially um, a sister school of the Jewish Theological Seminary. As I said to the chancellor of JTS, I am not moving to the competition, I am moving to our cousin. <laughs> and um, it's, it's truly a privilege, especially at this time of Israeli history to be moving to an Israeli academic institution uh, and to be able uh, to throw my lot in uh, with Shachter. In addition to being a rabbi, I am also an artist, as many of you have discovered. Uh, I worked on a Passover Haggadah for seven years time. Uh, and in addition to that, when I came to Israel, I joined forces with another um, very famous Ohioan Jew by the name of David Moss. David and I became partners in a wonderful Jerusalem-based project called Kol Haot. Uh, Kol Haot literally means the voice of the letter, the voice of the symbol. We have a studio space in Jerusalem's Chutzot Yotzer in the artist lane just below the Jaffa Gate. And what we do there is we teach Jewish history, texts, and values through the arts, visual arts and performing arts. And sometimes we even weave the culinary arts into what we do. We also run a program for Jewish day schools all throughout North America called Teacher Institute for the Arts. That's with the help of Legacy Heritage Fund. And uh, we work with 10 to 12 schools every year to teach them how to weave the arts more deeply into Jewish learning. That's a bit about me. This morning, the topic that I've chosen is on the origin of the menorah from the Bible to modern day. We're going to be using our parsha, parsha Temor, which is a very, very rich, multivalent parsha. We're going to be using that as the starting point, uh, and we're going to see how it is that the symbol of the menorah comes to be the central symbol of Jewish identity in so many ways. I want to begin with the question of what is the difference between a menorah and a Chanukiah? Okay, very good. A perfect place to begin is the number of branches that we're talking about. Okay, when we, we talk about a Chanukiah, 
How many branches of the Chanukia do we have? Eight. Excellent. Okay. Good answer. Eight plus one. Okay. Four on each side and then the Shamash in between. Right. And the Chanukia is related to our rabbinic Hanukkah. observance of the holiday of, thank you, Hanukkah. Esther, Chanukah. Exactly. Okay. So the Chanukia is related to Chanukah. And then the Minorah, even though, you know, for all intents and purposes, Right. Most of the Jewish world simply calls the Chanukiah a minorah, but technically it's not true. Right, The minorah is the ritual lampstand that is described in Torah that was part of the experience of the wilderness tabernacle, part of the Mishkan. And then later on, the minorah is brought into the first temple and second temple, Okay, we had we have very, very different narratives of exactly what it is that went on with the minorat in the first temple versus the but second both of, temple. Both, both of them have the root of nail for light. Excellent, Esther. Um, right. And so minorah, you hear ner, okay, ner as in candle, ner as in light, right? And minorah, the lampstand. Okay, so where does, you know, and, and the other piece that I want to say to you is that even though it's a central symbol in Torah, and later on, first temple, second temple, right, throughout Tanakh, just after the second temple is destroyed, the minorah disappears as a symbol for about 200 years. Very, very intriguing. And then relatively suddenly, it seems, we rediscover the minorah, and it becomes a very, very popular symbol in late, in late antiquity. Okay, so I want to understand, essentially, the development of the minorah, how the minorah came to be what it is, okay? and I want to understand how it is that it becomes such a central symbol of Jewish identity. So let's begin with this week's Parsha, Leviticus 24, verses 1 through 4. Who would like to read for us in a loud voice? Thank you. Your name is? Shira. Shira. Thank you, Shira. I am partial to the name Shira because my youngest daughter is Shira. Leviticus 24, 1 through 4. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the Israelite people to bring you clear oil of beaten olives for lighting, for kindling lamps regularly. Aaron will set them up in the tent of meeting outside the curtain of the path to burn from evening to morning before the Lord regularly. It is a law for all time throughout the ages. He will set up lamps on the pure lampstand before the Lord to burn regularly. Good. So here we're given this command. I just want to read it uh, quickly in the Hebrew. Good. <laughs> So what did we just learn from this passage? Well, actually, I want you want the menorah, but Chazal talks about the fact that a mo in the bear, you have it twice, the same word, in order to, the, for the Kohen to teach the young. Beautiful, Esther. Right, so... Essentially, right, it's being taught to all of Israel, right, the adults and the children. Right? And here we have this very, very specific command that's given to Aaron that he's in charge of kindling the lights, right, and also extinguishing the lights in the morning. So clearly the menorah is being used to illuminate the space, right, in the night, okay? Also connected to our near tamid, to the eternal light, yes. Years ago, there, maybe some folks here remember this, but there was a marvelous radio program produced by 
Jewish, Jewish theological theolo seminary Fantastic. called the Eternal Light. Beautiful. It's marvelous. Are, are those programs archived, you know? Are they available today? I believe they are, because yes. They are superb. Yes, no, I believe they are. And so what does the menorah symbolize for us? What are some of the general things that menorah symbolizes? Apart from its practical use of illuminating the night, okay, what, what does the menorah symbolize? Okay, Hanukkiah. Right, it's the Hanukkiah rededication. To me, light off. Shriah as in God's presence. Esther? Yes. You're on mute. To me, light is all. God created all, and if you think of um, the Greek philosopher, forget his name for a moment, and he talked about the light at the end of the tunnel. Like you see the light, light can be light, but light can also be understanding. Right, good. Light is light and understanding and also takes us back to the moment of creation. I think uh, oh, it was Plato. I couldn't remember. It was Plato who talked about the cave and the light at the end of the cave. A menorah physically looks like a tree uh, symbolizing Torah. Excellent. Therefore, our copy of the Hamash is eight time. Very good. Very good. Remind me of your name. Nina. Nina. I'm so happy you said that. And that's actually a perfect segue into the next text. Well, they're also by having the light on all night, you're signaling people, this is a holy place. Stay away from it. Right. Exactly. Good. But good. It also becomes a symbol of Kiddushah. It becomes a symbol of holiness. Let's take a look at the, the description of the menorah, Israelis. Israel is a light and its revelation. Beautiful. Another symbol of the menorah as being, right, casting its light forward, and so too with Israel being a light or legoyim, a light unto the nations. Okay, so Nina, since you said it, would you be willing to read for us in the English, please? We have a description of the, okay. I'm in the middle of my pills. Okay, no, that's, that's important. Oh, so. yeah. The symbol of the Israel. We're going to get to that. Uh, I don't want to get there too quickly. Yes, it is also a symbol of the state of Israel. Okay. We're good, Nina? Now can read. Okay, great. Nice and loud. Number two? Number two. Okay. Here we have a description of the menorah that comes to us from Sefer Shemot from the book of Exodus. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base and its shaft, its pups, palaces, and petals shall be of one piece. Six branches shall issue from its sides. See branches like the tree. Uh, three branches from one side of the lampstand and three branches from the other side of the lampstand. On one branch, there shall be three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with calyx and petals. And on the next branch, there shall be three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with calyx and petals. So for all six branches issuing from the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself, there shall be four cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with calyx and petals, a calyx of one piece with it, under a branch, a pair of branches, and a calyx of one piece with it, under the second pair of branches, and a calyx of one piece with it, under the last pair of branches, so for all six branches issuing from the lampstand, their calyxes and their stems shall be of one piece with it. The whole of it, a single hammered piece of pure gold. Make it seven lamps. The lamp shall be so mounted as to give the light on its front side and its tongs and fire pans of pure gold. It shall be made with all these furnishings out of a talent of pure gold. Note well and follow the patterns of them that are being shown you on the mountain. Great, thank you. Okay, so what jumps out at you reading this description? It, it talks about six a lot. And I'm thinking, and remember I said seven or eight plus one for the yeah. I'm thinking that the menorah is six plus one, or one being the box. Exactly, six plus one, yes. Lovely how you said that. Right, and one being Shabbat, bringing it all together for the yeah, days of the week. Christian talks about olive oil being for the light. There are many kinds of olive oils today. Is our 
Are there descriptions that are more specific than just oil from olives regarding the type and how it's processed and so forth, or no? No, not so, no, not so much, right? Mm. Right, well, what are yeah. we told uh, this, from this week's Parsha? Right, this week's Parsha tells us, right, that it needs to be clear oil of beaten olives. That's the extent of the, the, the description that we have about the olive oil that's used for lighting, right, that it's pure. What else jumps out from this, dis this description, Shira? It's sort of like you know, somebody from Cooper Union sat down and was annoyed. <laughs> and I want to take it further, Shira. Not only somebody from Cooper Union, but it seems a botanist from Cooper Union. Yeah, I want you to know well. But we have to remember that olive is a very popular in Israel. And it actually takes seven days, I did it with my students, to get the oil from the olives. Right, yes, the whole process of making the olive oil is a very, very complicated one. But what I want you to see immediately here is how deeply Torah is rooted in the land of Israel. And not only Torah, how deeply rooted the Israelites are in the land of Israel, simply from this description. I saw another hand up, oh, your name? Uh, Rachel. Rachel, thank you. Uh, one piece of the group. Excellent. Miksha Achat. It's from one piece of gold, and it did very good. Yep. So what I want you to see here is it's obvious that part of what it is that inspires the design of the menorah is the land of Israel itself. Noga Haru'ubeni, who is the founder of Neot Kedumim, how many of you have been to the biblical landscape reserve in Israel, right, not far from the airports, Modi'in, right in that area, right? A spectacular place that walks you through the agricultural cycle of the Bible. Doga yeah. Hari Uveni and his parents proved very, very beautifully that the design for the menorah comes from the Moriah plant that grows all over the land of Israel. And here you have a picture of that plant. Just take one look at that plant <laughs> and you will understand the description of the menorah immediately, immediately. The calyxes, the petals, right? The branches coming out of the central stem. There it is, right? There is the menorah in all of its full glory. Can we get a, a close up of that picture? A close up of the picture? Um, unfortunately, I, I don't have a close up. It was, um, the attachment was in the email. Ah, great. Okay, so this was sent out over email. What you can also do, oh, very nice. Thank you, David. Okay, what you can also do as well is go to Google Images. After Shabbat, of course, you should go to Google Images. Okay, and you can Google the Salvia plant or the Moria plant, and you will see this pop up. Let's take a look and see what it is that the menorah looked like when it was displayed in the first temple. I thought it was kind of interesting. You picked the picture that has nine branches instead of seven. Oh, instead of, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but um, there are clearly more branches on the Moria plant, more extensions, right, than we have, uh, than we have here. But uh, I also believe that it is connected to this magic number of ours to, to seven. Uh, what does calyx mean? Um, calyx are, um, they're like bulbs that flare out, okay? That, those are the calyxes, okay? Um, that's why I, I like to think that this was written by a botanist, no. right? Definitely. A Kaddish Bo, who God consulted with a botanist. And, and <laughs> there was Rabbi, another. You spoke about the magic of number seven. I think seven is good but I prefer eight because eight is completion. Right, interesting, yes. Like okay, but clearly- For me, Tikkun Olam is eight. Right, right. Or the Brit Mila is eight. Yes, it's eight, yeah. Um, it was interesting, it said that light should come from the front. I'm wondering, was there something, was it after, how do you get the light? If, if there's a candle, as we know it, or oil, how do you get the light burning from the front and not the back. It, well, it's interesting because the way they describe the candle, the, right, the, the, the candles burning is that um, the candles all, or the 
the lights all uh, incline inward toward the center. Okay, it's this very, very beautiful notion that they're all leaning toward the center, right? And what's also quite interesting too is the appearance of Shaked uh, Shkedia, right? Mm -hmm. Almond, okay? In the shape of almond, right? And it's interesting too that in Hebrew, Lishkod, right, is to watch over. It's like Lishmor, very, very similar to Lishmor. And so the minorah also becomes a symbol of God watching over us. Okay, so Rabbi, it's very, uh, I don't, Rabbi, I don't know if this is helpful or not, but if you look at ancient oil lamps, they're not like our uh, like a candle that just burns upward. They're a bowl which usually has a wick and a at one end. Exactly. So David, we're, we're, I don't and want if you, you to have jump the bowl at one end. You could have the light facing forward. Very good. Okay, so David, eventually we're going to get there. You'll yeah, see what does, you know roads look like in antiquity. We're going to get there. What yeah, I want to do is that. go to this source um, in the first book of Kings, number three. Let's read what it is that the Menorah yeah. looked like when it was displayed in the first temple. Who would like to read for us? And Solomon, bottom of the second page. Thank you. And Solomon made all the things that were in the house of the Lord, the altar of God, of gold, the table for the bread of his display, gold, lampstands, five on the right side and five on the left, is from the shrine of God. Good. Yes, I am so happy you jumped out of your pants and said that. What's <laughs> going on here? How many minorot do we have in the first temple? Okay. 10 minorot. Yeah. There were 10 lampstands on either side. Okay, it's absolutely clear from the text that it's describing multiple minorot that, that stood in the temple, right? The eta minorot chamesh mi yamin, the chamesh mi smol, zahab. Right, before the golden holy of holies, we had five on one side and five on the other. That's what existed in the first temple, according to the text in the book of Kings. <clears throat> Zechariah, however, right, on the other hand, okay, take a look what it is that, uh, that he describes. Source number four, who would like to read? Someone that hasn't read yet, thank you. The angel who talked with me came back and woke me as a man is wakened from sleep. He said to me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl above it. The lamps on it are seven in number, and the lamps above it have seven pipes, and by it are two olive trees, one on the right of the bowl and one on its left. Very good. Okay, so Zachariah gives us um, this uh, very, very detailed description of what the menorah looked like. Right now we're headed toward right second temple. And then we have this beautiful image, which is taken from a medieval Spanish manuscript that is based explicitly off of Zachariah's vision of the menorah. Right. Okay. And, and here, Nina, you see the calyxes beautifully, right? The calyxes on each branch, those are the pieces that are flaring out, right? Those, those are, uh, the calyxes that are described. You see the bowls of olive oil standing above the menorah. And then here, from the description of Zechariah, we have the olive trees flanking either side of the menorah. Now I want to fast forward to the end of uh, the period of the Second Temple. Remember, the Second Temple is destroyed in 70 CE by whom? Snowlands. Well, well, Okay, and what is it that we have uncovered from archaeological evidence? Take a look at the graffiti from Jason's tomb. Have any of you been to Jason's tomb? Mm -hmm. Shalom Plotkin. Where is Jason's tomb? No, but I suspect that you still have been to Jason's tomb. Hey, Jason's tomb is in the middle of a very famous neighborhood in Jerusalem, right around the corner from my office, in Rechavia. Okay, it is on Al Rechov Al Fasi in Rechavia. Okay, and it stands out 
quite dramatically that you can imagine. Okay, and this is where this particular image was found. Okay, this is taken from, um, it's believed that it comes from the first century uh, BCE. Okay, the second temple was still standing at that point. Then take a look at the Hasmonean coin um, from Mattathias Antigonus, 37 BCE. On one side of the coin, you see, you know, a very traditional image of the menorah, how it is that we imagine the menorah to be in our mind's eye with the six branches plus one. Okay, and then on the opposite side of the coin, right, any idea what it is that we see there? Aqueduct. It looks, it does look like an aqueduct. Metals. Okay. Hebrew. Like but, metals. but think okay. temple. Okay. This is the table of the shoe breads. Okay. That stood in the temple and possibly the platform that was used, right, to light the minorah. Okay. Um, plaster found in the old city of Jerusalem, which dates to 37 uh, to around 4 BCE. Okay, the, the three branches that you see drawn in here are the missing ones from this plaster relief, right? But clearly we have a very, very beautiful image, right? Imagined or based on actually seeing the menorah, what, what it is that the menorah look like. And finally, this very stirring image of the Arch of Titus. How many of you have been to Rome and have seen the Arch of Titus? Okay. So we have none other than the Roman soldiers carrying away the menorah that stood in the temple. By the way, Rabbi, talking about special places in Jerusalem, have you been to the Sanhedrin? I have, yes. It's amazing. Indeed, yes. There is a right. cave and there is, you kind of crawl and you go into one room after the other and it's all there. Exactly, yes, sir. right. Right, so I, so I want you to keep this image of the Arch of Titus in mind. We're going to get back to the image of the Arch of Titus. We're now at a, period, a point in Jewish history. Remember, 70 CE, the Second Temple is destroyed. Up until the destruction of the Second Temple, we do see this proliferation of images of the menorah. And then, like I said, radio silence for about 200 years regarding images of the menorah. Nothing after that. And it's believed that this was an expression of mourning for the temple, but that we weren't going to make raven images of the menorah as it, as it were. I call your attention to 135, 137 CE, the Bar Kokhba rebellion, the last stand of the Jews against the Roman authorities. With that, we lose sovereignty in the land of Israel, right? And then, Right. We, we have a number of Jewish settlements, right? Rabbinic Judaism, right, moves north, right? The cradle of Rabbinic Judaism is in the Galil, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there, again, around third, fourth, fifth century, once again, we see the menorah popping up. Mm -hmm. We see it on sarcophagi. Those of you who have been... Um, uh, up north uh, and have been to Tsipori uh, uh, and um, where Yehu uh, Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi is buried. Mm -hmm. um, not, not Beit Sha'an, it's on the tip of my tongue. Beit Sha'arim. Have any of you been to Beit Sha'arim up north? If not, this is the place to go. Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, who is responsible for the editing of the Mishnah, he is buried in Beit Sharim, and when you go to Beit Sharim, you see a number of sarcophagi, right? And many of them have the menorah inscribed. Yep. Right? It's at this point that the menorah becomes a national symbol of the Jewish people. So you see it on this uh, sarcophagus from a Roman catacomb. We see it in Jericho. Okay, this is a mosaic that comes from, uh, from Yericho. Uh, and often the image of the menorah is combined with both a lulav and etrog. And in addition to a lulav and etrog, we often see a shofar, right? All of these becoming symbols of the Jewish people. It's as if we're reclaiming that sacred memory. Remember, we're living at a time when we no longer have power in the land of Israel. We're immersed in Greco-Roman culture. And one of the ways that we're maintaining that sacred memory of the Jewish people is through material culture, like what it is that we see. 
David pointed out before that minorot, oil lamps, right? We're not typically what we think of as a lampstand, but rather what it is that you see the top right-hand corner of the study sheet, right? You see these oil lamps from the fifth to sixth century. But even today, the Orthodox people use an oil menorah, not a candles. Uh, not just Orthodox people, Esther. Yeah, but Plenty yeah. of us liberal Jews also use oil when we light candles. Okay. Oh, when I grew up in Israel, it was only the Orthodox who did. Okay. Now, today, it's across the board. Uh, you want to do it authentically, you use oil. And what is that cross like yeah. image? It's to the right of the, the Jericho menorah. Fantastic. You tell me your name. Elliot. Elliot. Elliot, I am so glad that you saw By that. Way, those folks were uh, born in Brooklyn. I'm proud to say I was born in Brooklyn Jewish hospitals. <laughs> I was also born in Brooklyn Jewish hospitals. <laughs> there we go. There's more than authentic Jews sitting in this room. <laughs> Sheila. You were also born in Brooklyn. Yeah, there we go. Okay. It was born in Mass. <laughs> I was so Elliot, your 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 I love your powers of observation here. I am so happy that you saw that. In a number of these images, you see a cross. Okay, we remember that we are in um, both the early years of Christianity, and Christianity is beginning to spread like wildfire at this point. Yeah. Okay, this is the Byzantine era. Churches are popping up all over, right? And we are seeing, right, the quintessential symbol of Christianity, which is the cross. And that cross is appearing everywhere in, right, in the land of Israel, as it were, and beyond. Okay, so you imagine yourselves, right, you, you are Jews living in the end of, land of Israel, and right, you have all of these Christians popping up amongst you with their particular symbol, right? The crucifixion, the cross. There's a wonderful book that I want to recommend to you, which is entitled The Cultures of the Jews by David Beale. If you haven't read this book, if it's not sitting on your Jewish bookshelf, it's a must. It's an encyclopedic can work. Of, can you repeat the name of the author? Yes, it's called The Cultures of the Jews. Cultures, plural. And the thesis of this book is that one of the characteristics of the Jewish people that make us so rich and so strong as a people is the fact that we have lived in multiple countries, right? And he argues that it is not about assimilation, but our story is about acculturation. Why are we so rich as a people? because we have learned from the peoples and the cultures in which we have lived. There has been a sharing amongst those cultures, right? And we know how to take something that we see and admire and to make it quintessentially Jewish. Okay, what is the most profound symbol of, of, of what I just described? Oh. Food and specific. <laughs> You're right. You're right. You're right, Rachel. It is, no, it, it is food. Okay. But what observance over the Jewish year is a perfect example of what I just described? Shavuot. We celebrated it one month ago. Pesach. But also Shavuot. Do you think that Pesach is quintessentially, Pesach was not born in Brooklyn Jewish Hospital. Okay. Pesach was born out of the Greco-Roman period. The Jews looked around what was going on in the Hellenistic world. Remember, the temple is destroyed and the rabbis have to recreate the ritual of Passover. Because remember, Passover was all about the roasting of the Paschal lamb, which we sacrificed in the precincts of the temple. Once the temple is destroyed, we can no longer sacrifice the Paschal lamb. And this is a major crisis for the rabbis. What are we going to do about our observance of Pesach? And so what did they do in all of their wisdom? They looked around the world in which they lived and they saw Hellenists, uh, Hellenists Greeks, right? Had symposia meals, eating at low tables. And what were they doing while they were eating? Reclining. They were leaning, they were reclining. Ah, 
a perfect model to tell the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, to tell the story of the Exodus from Egypt. We don't recline because we're royalty. We recline because this is a custom that we borrowed from Greco-Roman culture, okay? And that speaks volumes about us, right? That we're able to, to live in the larger world and we're able to adopt uh, these culture. Rachel. So the question I have is the, um, the, the paintings of the Last Supper. And that is in a period before what we're talking about. And how does the story of Jesus being at the Seder meal fit into a um, item that has a, a ceremony that hasn't happened yet? Because it's not a Seder. They've determined it was not a Seder. It couldn't have been because he wasn't he crucified. Most, most likely this was, it was not a Seder, okay? okay? It, may, it may have been, you know, it may have been a, a Passover meal, right? But remember, okay, we're talking, uh, 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 we're talking about a barbecue, okay? That's what we're talking about, <laughs> okay? A set table barbecue. And remember that the images that we see of the Last Supper are the product of the imagination of the artists who created those, right? It's, it's Da Vinci's imagination. Um, you want to see a very powerful modern image of the Last Supper, I encourage you to see Adi Ness's very, very famous photograph of Israeli soldiers sitting at a table that looks like the Last Supper. Very, very dramatic image in the collection of the Israel Museum. Okay, but my point here is that this is part of what it is that we do so beautifully as a people. And Elliot, the reason that you see images with a cross here is because it is absolutely clear. Okay, I, I am, I am saying this b'shem omro, um, Rabbi Professor Lee Levine, who is a very famous alumnus of the Jewish Theological Seminary, went on to become a professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, a true mentor and role model for the Masorti conservative Jewish world. He wrote a very very beautiful article on the development of the Menorah. And he makes the claim that we see the proliferation of the menorah in late antiquity precisely because of the proliferation of the cross as a symbol for Christianity. And so this becomes not just a, a friendly competition that was going on between the early Christians and the Jews, but it becomes vitally important for the Jewish people to affirm a symbol that is quintessentially theirs, the menorah. And so when they see the cross on these menorot, on these lampstands, they start producing menorot with a picture of the menorah. So right next to it, you can't see it so well, but if you look at the little protrusion that's coming out of the, 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 the mini oil lamp, Right, there's a menorah at the top of it. Yeah. Okay, you also see this um, on what they call Palestinian chancel shades. Um, take a look at the Hamat Gader synagogue, right? And compare that right next to it to the Masuot Yitzchak church. Okay, so you see the similarity between the two. Uh, and it's most likely the case that we were borrowing from the material culture that we saw around us. Okay, look just below too. You see the cross on the right side with lamps hanging from the cross. And then on the left side, you see these images of two minarot, of two lampstands, with lamps hanging from the lampstands. Okay, Elliot. Yeah, I think your point about borrowing and sharing symbols and other things from the cultures in which we were immersed. What about the humtza? That's not strictly Jewish. And uh, Israeli food and all this stuff is, you find the hummus That's and, right. and, and a lot of the things in the surrounding nations that right. are more Middle Eastern right. and strictly Israeli. Right. I, I love, and I think yeah, all of this should right. people uh, to be. Rabbi, I find many of the commentaries, that, the that commentaries. Elliot, uh, one moment after that, to me, Elliot, is the bottom line of all of this. Okay, or, you know, perhaps the punchline that I believe the reason that we as a people, right, should respect the diversity and the plurality in the world, right, is because that diversity and plurality has enriched us, enriched us immeasurably 
as a people. It has made us who we are, right? And we have the power to appreciate what it is that's special in another culture and take it into our world and make it uniquely Jewish. Esther? Yeah. If you study history, you see the influence of our commentaries at the time and the place where they were. The, the grammar of the time and the place, the philosophy, the life of them. So that's exactly. some of the reasons that you have such different views between the different commentaries. Right, exactly, Esther. Right, clearly the time in which you live affects the way it is that you interpret Torah and also Hamakom Gorem, the place yeah. in which you live also affects that's how it is that you understand. And that is the beauty. That, Exactly, and that, that, that's the beauty of this notion that revelation continues. Like I said last night, it didn't it stop at Sinai, it continues all the way down to today, Shalom. I remember when I was studying at the seminary, the JTS branch, it was called Schachter in Jerusalem, we went with Professor Lila Vitbein in his car, he drove us around the Galilee, where Judaism was starting to, to take hold again, to, to, to flourish. And I remember there was one symbol that we kept seeing, which was a fire pan, kind of like a square symbol with a, like a little shovel, shovel on, on the yes, bottom of it, yes. where the priest would put their incense. And it's interesting to me that that's not the symbol that caught on because, and I'm, I'm guessing maybe it was because, well, it's a symbol of destruction that the Romans crushed the, the Jews and dispersed us and destroyed our temple. But instead, the menorah, which kind of has that, um, I don't know, maybe like um, we're fighting back and the Hasmoneans beat back the Greeks and maybe it's, maybe we will rebel again. And I'm not sure if the rabbis didn't, really didn't want to um, revive that story a, 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 as much, but it was the menorah that really caught on. Beautiful. Okay. Nelson had a comment. Oh, for left. Nelson. Uh, Nelson, yeah. yeah. I, I was going to say that the, um, the most, the modern symbol of Christianity is the Christmas tree, and that's an upside down menorah. <laughs> I like the, I like that way of looking at it. Um, it was yes. When did, the star, when did the star of David become a symbol of the game? Uh, right, uh, Magen David. It's interesting because Magen David is not. You know, I'm talking about quintessential Jewish symbols. That was not a quintessential Jewish symbol. There was borrowing that went on from Islamic culture in terms of uh, of, of the Magen David. Um, I, I don't I don't want to go off on that tangent because that's that's another whole class. You'll have to invite me back for that one or come to Israel. <laughs> Where I do want to go though is um, there was a lovely gentleman that was sitting here that mentioned right how the Minorah becomes the emblem Bichon. of the state uh, of yeah. the state of Israel, and that's where I want to go now. Right, the bottom right-hand corner of, of, of the source sheet, we see the emblem of the state of Israel, 1948. And what I love so much about this is I want you to keep in mind the Arch of Titus. The image of the Romans carrying off the menorah in 70 CE. And what do we do in the modern? Now think about it. This is not a small moment, we just celebrated 75 years of, of, of Israel, okay? 137 CE, we lose sovereignty in the land of Israel. The next time that we regain sovereignty in the land of Israel, 1940, say it louder and with exuberance, 1948. And we have all been witness to that miracle. It's not a small miracle that we are part of this generation that is witnessing the rebirth of the Jewish people in its land, Shira. I was just saying the menorah is the way of saying, says you, Roman. There you go, there you go. That's exactly what's going on with this symbol, right? We are reclaiming it. We are bringing it back to the state of Israel. Um, and um, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps as I'm talking about it. Every time, Rabbi, every, time Rabbi, I teach, Rabbi. every time I think about the juxtaposition between the Arch of Titus and the emblem of the state of Israel, it, it gives me goosebumps. I wanna show you um, this very, very uh, beautiful paper cut that was done by my buddy, my mentor, David Moss. And when he heard that I was teaching on the menorah, um, he gave this to me so that I could pass it around and, and show it to you. Right, he created this very, very beautiful image of the menorah inspired by Psalm 67. Um, I want you to take a look at the very, very beautiful micrography of this piece. I'll pass it around. Um, 
questions, comments? Elliot, you, 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 yeah. cultural influences. What could be more powerful than uh, the, the idea that the foundation of Christianity is our Torah? They've adopted those texts. I've said to some of my African American church going students, Do you speak Hebrew? No, how could you ask? Did you ever say hallelujah? Oh, yes, yeah. Did you ever say amen? Oh, yes, yes. I know where that originates from. There you go. Right. Right. We do not have a monopoly on that cultural borrowing, right? but many other people uh, do. And uh, to me, this is the brilliance of, of David Beale's work. There was a request uh, right at the beginning of this class um, that I show you just a few images from my Haggadah. And so what I did is I brought um, some of the artwork to show you. And in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to do that just to give you a special treat. And then, I, of course, I want to be sure that we get into the main sanctuary uh, for all of the pomp and circumstance that is going to happen this morning. So I want to show you the opening image of uh, my Haggadah. Okay, there is a paper cut. Okay, and this paper cut is inspired by Parshat Kitavo. Right? Kitavo means literally when you come into the land. Okay, and what I did is I started my Haggadah there because it talks about the ritual of Havat Bikurim, the bringing of the first fruits, and says that when the Israelites come into the land of Israel, that you take their first fruits, wheat, barley, dates, pomegranates, figs, etc., gather them in a basket, set them by the altar, and then they make a declaration. What's the declaration that they say? My father was a Armenian. Ar Ar yeah, yes. I'm glad you said that too. Right. Um, my ancestor was a wandering, I heard Armenian. We often say Armenian. Aramean. Aramean. He went down to Egypt, few in number. Okay, this is the core of the Magid section of the Seder. So that's why I wanted to start my Haggadah there. There's the paper cut. And the way this was designed was so that the paper cut would sit over the landscape of Israel. Here we are talking about Israel, right? You see how the paper cut becomes a doorway or a gateway into the land of Israel. Okay. And Rabbi, yes. you were talking about symbols, but it's important that in the Jewish Congress, they decided to take the color of the Talit to make the Jewish flag. That too, exactly, right? When they were talking about the design of the flag, right, it came from religious influence, right? It came from the design of the Talit. Just look at the flag, look at a traditional Talit, right? And there you go, right? There's, uh, there's the flag of, of the state of Israel. Thank you for pointing that out, Esther. Right here, okay? These are all of the steps of the Seder woven into the days of the creation, right? The gold that you see here is 23 and a half carat gold leaf that's hand applied to the pieces. Thank you. Okay. The reason I did this is because I wanted to express that Seder is not simply about the hands-on ritual that we do around the table, but that it's woven into a deeper existential order. If you look at the very, very famous manuscript Haggadah known as the Sarajevo Haggadah, the Sarajevo Haggadah begins with the days of creation, right? And the statement that they're making is, right, Yetziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, Right, was God's thought at the beginning of creation. Right, this was all part of God's plan. Right, and that's part of what it is that I wanted to express in, in this particular piece. Here are the four children. For the four children, notice I call them the four children and not the four sons. For the four children, I chose a biblical character to represent each of the four children. Right? The prophetess Deborah is the wise child. King Ahab from the Book of Kings is the wicked. Lot, Avram's nephew, is the Tom, the simple, and Adam and Eve are the ones who don't know how to ask. Okay, so I'm going to share with you a cute story, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, and uh, that cute story is that this was not the original rendering of the four children. Right. In my original rendering of the four children, I had chosen Jonah as the wicked child or the wayward child, and I had Noah as the simple one. When I showed it to the couple that commissioned it, their faces fell to the ground. 
They were visibly upset with me. What did I do wrong? <laughs> Worse than their children. <laughs> their names. Their names. Grandchildren named Jonah and Noah living in Minneapolis. It's a home run on my part. Okay, and then they and then the grandfather started chuckling and he said, Matt, the real problem is that the labels fit. That Jonah is the wayward child, and that Noah is it was very, very sweet. We had a good laugh over it. Uh, but in the end, I had to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> and so Rabbi, uh so, you, Rabbi, so, Rabbi, did you notice that the, the fourth child, the language in the Agada changes from masculine to feminine. That's right. That's right. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And indeed, so that's true. Treat, yeah. So you treat. Okay. Men. And Esther, because you spoke about the talit, you remind me of one last piece that I'll show you. I wanted my Haggadah to come up to modern day. Okay. And so you have the text of Hatikva in my Haggadah. And what I want you to know, apropos of the conversation that we had on cultural sharing, the design of this is based on a ketubah from Ferrara, Italy, 1878. Mm -hmm. A ketubah that I fell in love with. I love the floral design of the ketubah. So I, I brought my sketch pad paints. I based the design on, on that particular ketubah. I put the text of the Israeli national anthem there at the center. If you look closely, you'll see that the vocalization, the vowels are in blue, playing off of the blue and white of the Israeli flag. Um, right? It's not just about leaving Egypt. It's about going into the land of Israel, and it's about embracing that gift that uh, we hold so dearly today. So I want to say Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And Ruchim to you. You should Thank all be blessed. You. And Mazel Tov to the B'nai Yishurin community. Um, you have chosen well. You didn't need to hear that from me. You know it already. Thank you, Rabbi. It was very interesting. My pleasure, Esther. Thank you for being with us. Nelson, thank you for being with us. Ivan, Carol. <laughs> oh, not Ivan. Okay. Oh, Ivan's here. Okay. Okay. Got it.